If you have one of these, and you have one of these, but you don't have one of these, you're missing half the fun of owning a computer. This is a modem, and with it you can turn your computer into a window on the world. How? Well, we'll find out today as we take a look at modems and bulletin boards on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by grants from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies, a nonprofit federation of 11 national societies for computer professionals. AFIPS, leadership and service in computer and information technology. Additional funding is provided by McGraw Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte the international standard. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee. Gary Kildall is off this week, and sitting in for Gary is George Morrow. George, we've been playing around with my computer here, using it as a terminal, and it is amazing these days how much of the world comes to me through this little wire, thanks to right. something called a modem, which is sitting inside here. Before we get any farther in the show, I want you to explain what a modem is and actually what it does. Well, Stuart, the information in the machine is uh, zeros and ones, which are voltage levels usually. Uh, the information that goes over your telephone line is generally tones. Uh, and it's an agreement about how to turn uh, voltage levels into tones, while the modem means modulator, demodulator. Modulating means to take those voltage levels, turn them into tones. Demodulating means to do the reverse. And so as long as you agree about these tones and voltage levels, why it all works. Just can talk to that. That's right. Okay, we're going to find out more about modems and bulletin boards on today's program. We'll meet several bulletin board operators, and we'll get into the legal questions which are now surrounding the whole bulletin board issue. First of all, we'll take a general look at modems and computer communications and see how they are changing the way people do things now. With little fanfare but a lot of ingenuity, a parent support group in San Francisco has found a way to enhance its operation with a computer. Parents Place offers education and support to parents of preschoolers, including supervised care, discussion groups, and professional advice. And now, for fathers and mothers too busy to drop in, they've added a computer bulletin board. Available to anyone with a personal computer, the Parents Place Bulletin Board is online every evening from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. It offers up-to-date articles on child rearing and answers questions about typical childhood events from temper tantrums to toilet training. One of the most popular aspects of the service is its interactive sharing of experience between new and often unsure parents. While the center keeps a telephone helpline open for voice communication, the popularity of the electronic message board is growing steadily. First-time fathers and new mothers can get answers to questions which might be difficult to ask face-to-face, -face, or simply seek reassurance. Most importantly, they can do it from home or work without having to move the family. The Parents Place Bulletin Board was started with a grant from Apple Computer as a convenience to the center's members. But it's proving to be more than an electronic messenger. It can be a survey taker and a trading post, a teacher and a referral guide. But most of all, it's a quiet place in which to share the common feelings and fears of parenthood. Joining us now is Ezra Shapiro, the West Coast Bureau Chief of Byte Magazine, and sitting next to Ezra, Rory O'Connor, news editor of InfoWorld Magazine. George? Uh, I have a heck of a time with these modems and all this computer stuff connected to the <laughs> telephone line. Uh, but you people at these publications probably use it an awful lot. Maybe you could tell us a bit about how InfoWorld uses 
all of their bulletin boards and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's not as smooth as as you uh, as as many people might think. We have our own problems too. But we uh, we have been using uh, modems and telecommunications for a number of years. I think journalists have been using them for uh, as long as as most anybody. Uh, we uh, obviously we gather stories in from the road and so on, and we use electronic mail systems to communicate with our bureaus in various parts of this country and also with the publications that our company owns in various parts of the world. So I can exchange stories or uh, research information or notes or simply uh, ask an editor in Europe uh, if he can do an interview for me and supply me with that and kind of information. And you do this regularly? Oh yes, uh, in fact we just uh, did it last week for the front page story. We uh, needed to have a pair of interviews done over in Europe, one in Stockholm and one in Paris, sent some electronic mail to our offices there and uh, got the interviews back within a few hours over the same electronic mail system. Rory, why is that communication better than a telephone? Why can't you call that guy in Europe and ask him about the interview? Well, one problem with dealing with places like Europe or Asia is the time zone difference. Uh, that's the reason people use telex, for example, is uh, because if I pick up a phone in the middle of my day, it's uh, 3 in the morning and the editor in Paris doesn't like to be woken up. Uh, another reason is that uh, over the telephone, if he was to give me notes or a story, I would have to have someone sit down with a, he a headset and type this all into our computer, yeah. whereas if it's prepared in Europe, uh, it can be sent over the wire mm -hmm. and it's in my system ready for a reporter to use. Ezra, now you run your own bulletin board. Tell me what that is. I've been sort of a nut about these things for about three years, and I have finally set up a bulletin board system in my basement that runs on my computer when I'm not using the machine. And it's there as a sort of community chat center and a source of public domain software programs for people who want to download or upload them. Is there any particular type of uh, programs that you offer on your network, on your bulletin board? Stuff basically that I'm interested in. Such uh, as? There's an area for Radio Shack Model 100 computers. There's another area for fairly technical programs for the IBM PC. And there is another area for the software for the bulletin board itself. So that if somebody wants to set up a bulletin board, he can call my system and get the software so that he can do it in his own. If somebody else were going to do this, what kind of uh, prices and what kind of uh, complexity do you run into? Well, the complexity is, is uh, I'll take that issue first. Basically, all this stuff is confusing. Uh, and it takes a lot of time working with manuals and trying to figure it out, particularly because most of the bulletin board systems are public domain software. They're not very well documented. Mm -hmm. So plan to spend a good deal of time. But for a modem and a computer and a second phone line coming into your house, the software is free. You can spend anywhere from six, seven hundred dollars on up into enormous sums. Ezra, now you mentioned it is complicated, and George, you mentioned this is even too confusing for you a lot it of this is. stuff. Why is, does this have to be so confusing? Why are there so many different standards, and I've got to answer all these questions about parity and protocol and baud rate and so on to do this? Well, look, look at the number of things you're trying to link together. You've got the software, the computer, the cable to the modem, the modem, the phone system, the cabling that goes from one, or satellite stuff that goes from one phone location to another phone location, then possibly a very different combination of modem and computer at the other end. So you're dealing with lots of elements here. Each one, I guess, have, have their own standard, you see. Yeah, yeah. Now, when it comes to, there are people watching this program who are not into modems, bulletin boards, or CompuServe yet, and they're thinking about buying them, and you see this tremendous variety of modems out there, low-priced, high-priced, all kinds of different uh, factors and standards they can get to. Uh, how do you tell somebody what's the right modem for them? It depends on what they want to do and uh, what they want, what kind of information they want to get uh, uh, on the other end of this phone well, where line. Where do they go for this? Uh, Ezra? Well, my recommendation for almost any kind of technical information is join a local computer club or users group. There is always somebody there who has paved the way a few months earlier or a few years and earlier. And my feeling is one of the best resources in computers is the users user groups. Group. Yeah, we get whatever the problem is, that, that's often the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the, uh, there's a lot of talk about the peculiar or particular way that people behave on a bulletin board when they talk to each other in this sort of blindfolded fashion. Yeah. What have been your observations, both of you, yeah, about the social about psychological aspects of communicating via modem? It, it's, it is different, certainly, than communicating uh, via telephone, because to a certain degree, you're, you're insulated. Uh, you can choose, for example, to back out of a conversation and listen for a while. It's sort of like a party line, if you like, a telephone term. Would you say that people are more adventuresome in this environment, or less, or, or is there any feeling? There are the equivalent of uh, personals. 
uh, uh, advertising and bulletin boards and uh, uh, you know computer dating uh, among people and then there are bulletin boards with their specific specialties that range from the unusual like uh, survivalist bulletin boards to uh, what some people might consider to be outrageous right through pornography and and so on uh, Ezra, Ezra when you when you talk on your bulletin board what do you call it by the way what's your you have a name? The software is called Fido Bulletin Board Software, uh -huh. and since I was thinking about rewriting it at one point, my board is called Modifido. Modifido. So just okay. get a bad When you're on Modifido, uh, do you behave differently? I mean, do you think you communicate differently with the people you're on because you're at a keyboard instead of in person? Well, there I'm controlling the thing, and I'm much more puppet master behind the scenes. But when I log on to another bulletin board or a big service like CompuServe or The Source, I, I have seen quite a few things that indicate that people are dealing with this stuff differently. You're typing little letters and they disappear very quickly. And you can be anything you want to be behind those letters. There have been any number of romances that have led to marriage. Really? And there was one, and, and you know, it goes to the other side too, there was one woman who attempted to commit suicide while online on one of these major services typing in I am now killing myself and fortunately somebody Sorry. listening to this stuff reading this stuff actually said wait a minute this is serious this was not a hoax this was not a hoax no um, so you're you're getting all sorts of different types of social behavior now that range through all the psychoses and neuroses of the general populace is this a fad, uh, you think, the bulletin board? Is this CB radio and then yes. it'll die out? Or is this a kind of new permanent way for people to communicate with each other? We reported in a, a recent issue of a, a study that was done by a market research firm that said by the end of this decade, uh, a majority of the population, or majority of the American workforce anyway, will have the opportunity uh, to, at least some of the time, use modems and computers to do their work, white collar work, and work at home. Uh, what they call telecommuting. And uh, this does not seem uh, that it's going to die out, but it, it's going to gradually increase in popularity. The, the complexities uh, have to be uh, addressed how could, first. How could we possibly expect more uh, computers in homes than typewriters? <laughs> and I don't think there are, there are probably 60% of the homes on a high end guess that have typewriters. Type Mm -hmm. Why would there be more computers in homes than typewriters? Well, your corporation at some point might very well provide a low-cost anyway. communications terminal. For a few hundred dollars, you I'm can sure put together IRS, a keyboard, a screen, and so But I'm sure the IRS will find a way to tax well, that. Well, George, yes. to help answer your question, actually, we sent out a reporter, Wendy Woods, to take a look at how people are using computers now and modems to telecommute. Steve Renton goes to work every day like thousands of other San Franciscans, but unlike thousands of others, Steve doesn't have to fight the traffic to get there. Steve is among 75 Pacific Bell employees who telecommute. Using his home computer, Steve spends 20 hours a week compiling data for Pacific Bell's marketing department and sends it via modem to the company's time-sharing network. For me, it's wonderful. It improves my productivity. Uh, it makes for greater clarity of thought, consistency of work, and it saves me the cost and hassle of commuting. And I have all the amenities of home at the office. Those involved in the test do spend some time at the office. Human interaction is still a vital part of doing business. But their ability to be at home has big advantages for both employee and employer. Some of the ones that we've identified already include uh, cost savings, reduced overhead from the office space savings, also improved recruiting of new employees by being able to offer them flexible scheduling. So those are some of the types of savings as well as timeshare savings from the flexible schedules that telecommuting offers, enabling uh, companies to access their mainframe computers at odd times, um, cut down on their timeshare costs. Pacific Bell estimates there are 7.2 million Americans who could be working at home. Over the next few months, the number of people working for Pacific Bell at home is expected to increase to about 100. And what better place for a test like this than at a company whose business is the telephone? For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Joining us now is Matthew McClure. He's the sysop of a bulletin board system here in the San Francisco Bay Area called The Well. And sitting next to Matthew Don Ingram, who's assistant district attorney for Alameda County across the Bay. And uh, George Don has been involved in the prosecution of cases dealing with computer crime. 
You know, these modems are awful hard to use. Maybe one of the advantages that I get out of it is perhaps access to a new kind of communicating tool. Is that something that the well offers? Yeah, it does. The idea is that anyone with a personal computer and a modem uh, can dial into the well and have access to hundreds of other people uh, with their knowledge and their information uh, uh, who are also talking to the well with their but computer. But why would I use something like that rather than a telephone? What is the advantages that I have? Not well, one of the things that teleconferencing does is when you post a notice on a bulletin board or in a teleconference, you are reaching 100 or 200 people within the space of, say, 24 hours. And if you were to try to find someone who knew the answer to your question, it might take you 10 or 20 phone calls. Uh, if you put a question up onto a network, you'll get an answer back within 24 hours Obviously most of the time. Obviously more efficient. Yeah. What kind of things do you have here on the well? I mean, uh, the, I see what well, things we, in the real world and things in computers. Right. We've got most of the user groups uh, are represented on the well, so that if you have a technical question about a computer, you can put your question up and someone will answer it. We have public domain software for mm -hmm. computers. But the more interesting stuff in teleconferencing, I think, is in the real world. Uh, we have a spirituality conference, a legal conference. Uh, I see something up here, the pub. Yeah, the corner pub. That's, uh, well, I knew you'd find the pub eventually. <laughs> <laughs> people go here to relax. I see. Uh, Where's the, the lubrication? <laughs> that's provided by the users. <laughs> I see. It's in the disc drive, George. <laughs> right. When we leave the pub, we have a message that asks people to please drive carefully. <laughs> well, let's change that to please type carefully. <laughs> yeah, right. It's you more need suitable, to. <laughs> wouldn't you? So, so what goes on in the pub? This is really like a, a computer pub. Yeah. There's, uh, here's meeting at the bar, where there have been 149 responses so far. And, Does uh, this mean 149 people, or perhaps somebody... No, in this case, there are several people who have... Uh, we get into some repartee in the pub, I and uh, people going back and forth. Uh, what we, is some of the repartee? Uh, I'm not sure you want to repeat it here. <laughs> we got Don here, remember that? Oh, that's right. assistant <laughs> DA here. That's right. <laughs> well, let's skip that then. <laughs> We could. Uh, we have a telecommunications conference that's kind of interesting since we're talking about modems and telecom. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the items in there uh, is when I was told I was going to be on this show, we said we were going to be talking about some of the legal issues. And one of the questions that I was interested in was what was the text of the Computer Pornography and Child Exploitation Act and of 1985. So I went to the well where uh, some users had downloaded it and typed it in, the full text of the... Uh, so uh, one person does a little work here, and a lot of people have the potential benefit of it. That's the idea, yeah. OK, Don, let's get you into this. Now that we're talking about this legal issue, uh, which Matthew brought up, uh, and he mentioned legislation pending in Washington right now. I mean, there's legislation also here in California. How does the law currently view a bulletin board? Is it like a newspaper with First Amendment rights, or is it like a utility subject to government regulation? That's an interesting question, because the legislatures, obviously, here and nationally, are dealing bulletin boards holding them to some sort of a standard of responsibility and what they carry on. Uh, the problem in implementing those laws in a court is going to be what is the extent to which the First Amendment protections are going to apply to this kind of immediate online electronic communication. So there's a real problem here. This is an ongoing conversation. It can be taking place over a long period of time. Who is responsible for what any particular person says? If they run your credit card number, yours personally, that's not the kind of thing any newspaper would run. They wouldn't stay in business. You could sue them. But you can run it here. It's been done. It causes harm. But we're talking now let's, uh, criminal liability, right? I mean, suppose I published a newsletter with people's credit card numbers. I mean, I have the right to publish the newspaper, don't I, in terms of my criminal liability? I think you'd better be subject to a prior restraining order. You certainly could be sued later by the people who were the victims of it. This one, particularly, is in regard to child pornography and child abuse. We have boards here that are designed for people who are interested, if indeed obsessed with the idea of committing sexual attacks on children, and this is a way they communicate. All the benefits of anonymity, of being able to go online and the rest of it, which don't exist with paper, yes. do exist on this board, and it creates some incredible legal There's situations. There's no way to tell. If a call comes in, Matthew, <laughs> under the well, is there any way to tell where that call has come from? Not really. There's, I see. Anyone so, can sign up, and yeah. they can have any see, this kind is, of predilection. This yeah. is the problem. Yeah. If you print somebody's uh, credit card number, we can find you. But if uh, that happens, well, on as Don well, points out, it's certainly a harder problem. <laughs> Matthew, as a sysop, you're you're a guy who might be on the line under some of this legislation. Mm -hmm. What kind of control do you have, and do you think you ought to have uh, over what people put on your bulletin board? Well, it's a two-edged sword. There's control on the one hand, and there's privacy on the other, and. Uh, my stance, and that of most of the BBS operators that I know, uh, is to err on the side of privacy. 
that if someone, especially in private mail, uh, we regard that as inviolate, and no government or anyone else has any business in, in getting in there on what people have done privately on the well. Um, if I were to be responsible for every word or every character that anyone put up on the well, it would be a very burdensome task, and I wouldn't be very likely to go out and do a bulletin board service. It, yeah. That's what Could, we mean if by somebody, it. Though, if somebody put up a credit card number, is it practical for you to edit that in real time so that it doesn't show up? No. I, unless I, um, it would be impossible for me to know that it had happened. We have a multi-user system where there are as many as 30 people on at once, and yeah. if one of them is typing something, I have no way of knowing. This is a real problem. Yeah, now, now, Don, Matthew says he would err on the side of privacy. Is that a mistake? I think it probably is the right way to go if we're going to make a legal issue out of it. It's certainly the last thing any legislator wants is to destroy a thing of the potential for our national communication, for people to get together and rap, for people to talk that this affords. There are going to be snakes in Eden. There always are. Yeah. I'd hope a system's operator would not be chilled, but would not encourage it. Every board we've had to take so far, and we've taken several, has encouraged people. Let me know how to hack the school. Let me know how to hack NORAD. Uh, you can got good numbers so we can rip off the telephone company. Now, if I can prove he put that on his board, I have no trouble, moral, legal, any other way, in saying this person is being socially irresponsible, they're abusing a good technology. But he would individually be no more responsible for a credit card number than the manager of a supermarket if somebody stuck it on his board. No law would create that responsibility. But, but in a sense, as a sysop, doesn't that put Matthew in the position of having to kind of make these judgments? I mean, there, there might be some close calls where perhaps in, in your sexual pornog child pornography case, perhaps someone is calling up asking for advice or wanting to talk to other people with a problem. Uh, that might be a very useful uh, function of the bulletin board, still, and yet he might be tempted to erase the thing. It could be, and that is a risk we're going to have to run with a new technology that promises as much good and, unfortunately, risks as much evil as this does. You know, in social problems, there's two attitudes to take. Just fix a problem anyway, or be careful about fixing it. Maybe you'll make it worse. Yeah, Matthew, we have just about a minute left. Are you concerned? I mean, you find yourself being more conservative and other people in the bulletin board community uh, uh, kind of yeah. suffering from what we call a chilling effect of all this leg legislation? Yeah. When uh, the... Pacific Telephone went in and raided Tom Simpitas for uh, having some kind of uh, telephone credit card number on his board and took his equipment and seized $6,000 worth of stuff. Uh, a lot of bulletin board services the next day, uh, who had previously been free and open, started requiring registration, password, uh, money, and whatnot to get in because they were afraid. Gentlemen, we're out of time. Thank you very, very much. There are lots of social questions raised by communications on bulletin boards. One of them is the etiquette of the people who can talk to each other kind of hiding behind their keyboards. And our commentator, Paul Schindler, has some final thoughts on that. What do you mean I need a modem to access a bulletin board? Why, why can't I just walk up to it? Oh, oh, you mean an electronic bulletin board. Well, seriously, electronic bulletin boards really are nothing more than bulletin boards in electronic form. Of course, that means they don't have the pictures and cartoons, which are so much a part of bulletin board lore. Now, I say for the most part, because you can draw pictures with letters on a screen, and if you don't believe it, sign on any bulletin board at Christmas time, and you'll see several dozen Christmas tree cartoons. Again, like so much else in the world of computing, electronic bulletin boards are bulletin boards taken to the nth degree. They're bigger, wider, and faster than any mere physical bulletin board. They amount, in fact, to a new form of communication. Participating in an electronic bulletin board is a unique experience. It isn't like talking to someone in person or talking to them on the phone. I know I belong to a half dozen bulletin boards, most of which I check every day. Bulletin boards are still primitive. Not technically, but socially. If you're looking for a big opportunity, why not try to be the Emily Post or Miss Manners of bulletin boards? They've yet to develop real etiquette, and some of them really need it. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, IBM has introduced its local area network system. The IBM network will be a token ring system. It is not compatible with Ethernet and will not be able to network minis or mainframes. The software and circuit cards to make the system work will cost about $800 per workstation. IBM says its new network system can link up more than 200 PCs and peripherals. Other LAN vendors are expected to hop on board the IBM standard to develop compatible networking products. 
Another major development this week was the unveiling of Intel's new 32-bit chip, the 8386, essentially a mainframe on a chip. IBM is reported to be working on the successor to the AT, which will use the new 32-bit chip. That computer is expected to be out in 1987. The 8386 can access 250 times more data than a 16-bit chip. K-Pro has cut the price of two of its PC compatibles, the 16E and the 16-2E. Prices slashed about 20%. Ericsson is calling it quits in the U.S. desktop market. The Swedish company says it will focus on telecommunications and network products instead. Digital Equipment Corporation has announced a major move in CD-ROM technology. DEC will sell a CD-ROM drive for the Rainbow and the IBM PC. DEC will also be selling databases on LaserDiscs. It's software review time, and here's Paul Schindler. As football once again takes over America's living rooms, every armchair quarterback in the country yearns to be out on the gridiron directing a National Football League team. Now you can with NFL Challenge, an official National Football League product. For all of you who have ever hankered after the real thing, here it is in computer form. The game starts with a coin toss. You can choose to play another person or against the computer. The offense chooses from among five groups of six plays, while the defense chooses from among five groups of plays. Maybe you've heard of the overtwist, Willie. I haven't. Notice that there's a time clock and a scoreboard on the view of the field. Then, each play is shown in X and O notation, followed by an instant replay. If you can't finish the game, you can store it and restart it later. To keep things interesting, NFL Challenge randomly throws in penalties, injuries, interceptions, and fumbles. For $99, about twice the usual price of a game, you also get these handsome playbooks and a book on football strategy. This is the rarest of birds, a game you can load on your hard disk because it's not copy protected. NFL Challenge comes from Zor, that's X-O-R, in Minnetonka, Minnesota. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. In our legislative update file, the Joint Congressional Economic Committee was due to hear testimony last week from the president of Hitachi, but Suneo Tanaka failed to show up. The committee is investigating charges that Hitachi dumped computer chips on the U.S. market at what were described as predatory prices. And the computer industry is up in arms over a proposal before the House Ways and Means Committee, which would drastically cut back tax benefits of high-tech research and development. One Hewlett Packard spokesman said the tax proposal would cost his company $100 million a year. Soviet spies in the Silicon Valley are finding it easier to track down the latest military technology projects. They've signed on to use Dialog, a sophisticated online database operated by Lockheed. It features such spy-tempting sections as federal research and progress and defense markets technology. It looks like one of the original computer magazines is about to fold. Word is that Ziv Davis will be pulling the plug on creative computing at the end of this year. The annual North American Computer Chess Championship opened in Denver last week. The favorite, a chess computer called Hi-Tech from Carnegie Mellon. It has 64 VLSI chips, one for each square of the board. Hi-Tech's designer says a computer will someday be the world's best chess player. Finally, if you're looking for the ultimate high-tech Christmas card, here it is, the Jingle Disc from Thoughtware. It'll run gorgeous color Christmas scenes on your computer while it plays a variety of Christmas carols. It's $9.95, and it runs on Apple, IBM, and Commodore. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by grants from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies, a nonprofit federation of 11 national societies for computer professionals. AFIPS, Leadership and Service in Computer and Information Technology. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard.